Good afternoon and welcome to the AgriAbility webinar series. My name is Paul Jones. I am the manager of the National AgriAbility Project at Purdue University. And our topic today is osteoarthritis, joint stress, and injury prevention in livestock production. Our presenter is Amber Wolf. And before I turn things over to Amber, I am going to uh, just give you a few basic webinar instructions. You will need speakers or headphones in order to hear the presentation, as we are not using a phone connection today. If you would like to check your connection speed, you may go to the meeting menu and uh, you, uh, check my connection speed. And dial-up is not recommended uh, for this presentation. is probably not even usable. If you have questions during the presentation, you may type those in the chat window and hit the return uh, bubble there. Also, we will have a question and answer period at the end. And if you do have a microphone and or webcam, you can click the raise hand icon, which is at the top of your screen, indicate that you have a question, and we will activate your microphone so that you may ask that verbally. We will have four short survey questions at the end, so please stick around for those. And we are recording this um, for uh, archiving on our website, and the website is listed there. We'll also plan to put that in the chat window. If you have any problems uh, in terms of the technical aspects of the webinar, please use the chat window first. And if you're not able to do that, please send an email to agribility at agribility.org. And that is already up in the chat window also. Uh, potential issues that we've experienced in the past, if you are having echo, check to see if you are logged in twice. And if so, log out at least one time. If our speaker, our presenter, gets disconnected, please just hang on, and we will uh, reconnect as soon as possible. And if you are disconnected as a participant, please just log in again. For those that are not familiar with AgriBility, it is sponsored by the US Department of Agriculture and focuses on assisting agricultural workers with any kind of disability. Every AgriBility project is a partnership between a land-grant university and at least one disability services organization. Currently, there are 20 uh, state and regional AgriBility projects covering 22 states, and there is one national AgriBility project led by Purdue's Breaking New Ground Resource Center. And our nonprofit partners include Goodwill of the Finger Lakes, the Arthritis Found Foundation Heartland Region, of which Amber Wolf is a staff member, and our evaluation team at the University of Illinois and at Colorado State. If you'd like more information, please check us out on agribility.org. Amber Wolf uh, joined us at the National Project in 2009, and she does a variety of arthritis-related activities around the country uh, and, India, and in Indiana. So I'll turn things over to her now for the body of the presentation, and then I'll return at the end for our poll questions. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for having me today, and thank you for everyone um, for joining us today for this topic on osteoarthritis and joint stress and injury prevention in livestock production. We decided that, that this was a topic that needed to be discussed based on some of the data that we have from the AgriAbility Project. Last year, we had a little over 1,300 clients served across the United States. And of those 1,300 plus clients, both livestock production and arthritis were the top ranking selections in their categories based on the type of production that they did and the type of disability that they were reporting. Because of those numbers and because of the fact that arthritis is the number one disability in America, with nearly 50 million Americans having a diagnosis of some form of arthritis, we knew that this was an increasing concern for farmers and ranchers. So we thought that this would be a good webinar for us to present to you today. The occupational risks that we're going to discuss today um, that come along with raising livestock are numerous. They are directly related to osteoarthritis pain, decreased functionality, and difficulties just um, providing the, the care that's needed to livestock production on the farm. We'll start out with a little bit about arthritis itself and defining arthritis. 
The term arthritis simply refers to the inflammation of a joint. It is used to refer to over 100 different rheumatic diseases that are characterized by problems in and around the joints. So that includes inflammation, pain, um, and degeneration around the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, several areas that support the joints, as well as the joints themselves. Nearly all of those forms do cause joint pain, and they do restrict motion. And most of them are chronic and have no cure. The inflammatory types of arthritis also cause systemic problems as well, such as fatigue that can also interfere with the physical work that is required for a farmer or a rancher. Currently, the numbers show that 50 million people in the United States have doctor-diagnosed arthritis. Since we have completed this webinar, the Centers for Disease Control did release new data just within the past two weeks, showing that that number is now closer to 53 million Americans that have some form of doctor-diagnosed arthritis. By the year 2030, they do estimate that that will be 67 million, or 25% of our total population in America. One quarter of the Americans in this country having a form of arthritis is a pretty serious disability that we need to be concerned about. It is the most common cause of disability in the United States in the workplace, limiting nearly 21 million Americans in their jobs. In the agricultural production areas of ranching and farming, osteoarthritis is the most common form um, of those arthritis types, but that's not to say that we don't also see cases of rheumatoid arthritis, gout, fibromyalgia, or even lupus in the farming and working industries. And a little bit in addition about arthritis, more than half of the individuals who have arthritis are younger than 65 years of age. So that is a common myth that arthritis is mainly a form um, of, of an aging form of a degeneration, but it's not always the case. There are some risk factors involved with osteoarthritis particularly. Uh, with some risk factors that cannot be controlled are things like a person's age, their gender, and their genetic and family history. Now, while we're saying that osteoarthritis is a degenerative form of arthritis and it isn't necessarily based on a person's age, at some point it does become associated with the certain later stages of life, anywhere from 40 to 45 years of age, because at that point the joints have just simply worn themselves down. But it can occur much more earlier in life, depending on what the person has done with their body. There are risk factors that a person, cannot, or a person can control to a degree, things like having excess weight on a person's frame, supporting their joints properly while they're working. They can control the types of activities and sports that they participate in, specifically when there's a high risk of injury in those activities. And they also can control to some degree their occupational hazards, simply by being aware of what those hazards are and taking the proper precautions. There are several forms um, or several cases of osteoarthritis that don't have to come from that degeneration of a joint, but can also come from the injury of a joint as well. Some signs and symptoms to be aware of, whether you yourself are battling arthritis pain or if you know someone who is, some things that can bring to mind that this might be a, a diagnosis they need to look into. If they have persistent pain with no relief, early detection really is key to identifying osteoarthritis or any form of arthritis. And if there's persistent pain for two weeks or more that doesn't tend to go away um, using any of the methods that a person would commonly look into, such as over-the-counter medications, ice packs, heating pads, they really need to see a specialist, probably a, a, either a general practitioner if it's osteoarthritis pain, or maybe even a rheumatologist if they're looking into more of that systemic forms of arthritis. If they see stiffness, swelling, redness or heat, or even a locking of the joint that is, again, persistent and doesn't go away, that's a good indicator of an arthritis form. Difficulty performing daily activities or difficulty moving the joint. If um, one day uh, you wake up and you're working around the farm and a task that has normally been very simple and very easy to complete all of a sudden has more difficulty. Maybe your range of motion is limited and you can't reach for livestock feeds that are on a higher shelf or maybe your grip strength is limited and you can't open gates the way you used to. Those are good indicators that you're having difficulty utilizing that joint and it needs to be looked into. If there are some other signs like fatigue or weight loss or nausea, those tend to be more red flags for those systemic forms of, of arthritis, specifically looking into things like rheumatoid arthritis. So it's very important that you also notice the other key uh, factors and symptoms that come along with your general body health, besides just that inflammation or swelling or stiffness of a joint. Now with osteoarthritis, the type that we see most often in agriculture, it is the degenerative form of arthritis, so we'll be talking more about the breaking down of the cartilage in that joint. 
So osteoarthritis, again, is that wear and tear degeneration. It's an arthritis that is generally affecting um, the weight-bearing joints, which would be the knees, the ankles, and the hips, but it can occur in any joint in the body depending on where the injury or the stress has occurred. Uh, it is not necessarily a consequence of aging. It is more of a, a progression of the degeneration of the cartilage. The cartilage itself is breaking down inside a joint, and I'll show you an image of that on the next slide. It does affect usually uh, only certain joints in the body, those that have been overused or have been injured, normally starting out on one side of the body because everyone has a dominant side, but it can affect multiple joints at once, and it can become progressive to the point where a person can have several different areas of osteoarthritis pain in their bodies. That osteoarthritis will affect the range of motion of the joint. There will be pain and tenderness, and it may cause some swelling as well. In the next image, you can see a picture of the evolution of osteoarthritis, and you can see the normal healthy cartilage in the first bone. Um, the cartilage is, is basically a barrier. It provides a cushion between the ends of the bones um, in a joint. And as well, uh, some things that you won't see on this image that you have to be concerned with also are things like the tendons and the ligaments and the muscles that surround that joint. Because a weakness in any of those areas will also cause a weakness in the joint, which allows for this degeneration to occur at a more rapid pace. So you can see in the image where the cartilage starts to thin and break down, and eventually there could either be pieces of that cartilage in the joint that, uh, that can move around, causing significant pain, or that cartilage thins to the point where the bones can physically touch each other um, when that joint is moved, also causing very significant pain. The effects of osteoarthritis and, and what it does to a person living and working um, in an agricultural environment, whether it's farming or ranching, is very similar to the actual occupation itself of farming or ranching. Uh, you know, it's a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week occupation. We are always concerned with the welfare of our animals, the weather, and how that's going to affect things on our farm. Those type of things don't stop just because it's the end of the day or the sun has set. Very similarly with arthritis pain, once that arthritis has set into a joint, it's not, going to, um, it's not going to leave. There is no cure short of physically replacing those joints entirely. So it's something that a person has to be very uh, aware of how they deal with their arthritis pain, maybe recognizing some things that set off arthritis flare-ups or cause more pain, um, depending on what's happening on the farm or the ranch. And as hard as that might be, many farmers have a difficulty accepting that they might need to change their routine or change the way they do their work to be able to control their arthritis pain. And it very much becomes a balancing game of how do they balance managing that arthritis, whether it's preventing further pain or managing the pain that they do have, but also still being able to be productive in their operation. The pain and the fatigue and the stiffness that come along with the arthritis is, is greatly going to limit that farmer or rancher depending on where their pain is and what they're trying to accomplish. It may cause difficulty completing certain tasks or, or even leaving a farmer just feeling very overwhelmed because of the nature of the pain or um, maybe getting behind in their work because of their pain. So at, at times it's very important that we remember that in agriculture and in farming and ranching, it's a very repetitive forceful job. So the things that we're going to talk about today related specifically to livestock production and the different species of livestock and the different areas of production, anytime there is an example of a repetitive or forceful motion or movement, those are indicators of when um, that arthritis pain might flare up. Some common sources that we're going to talk about today in a little more detail um, would be things like extension of the joints or overextension of the joints, um, whole body vibration and things that are occurring while farmers and ranchers are using machinery on the farm, compression of the joints and compression specifically of the spine and the hip area, repetition in the movements and repetition in the type of chores that are being done on the farm. A lot of lifting and carrying goes on in livestock production, and a lot of climbing or bending or twisting as well. And now we're not going to be able to discuss every single species of production in detail today. Uh, we're going to try to touch a little bit on each area of production, but I would suggest that after this webinar, if you still have questions related to the specific type of production, whether you are in poultry production or swine production, certainly look into um, further resources that we'll have available at the end of the, the webinar, or even contact your local county extension educator. They will be able to help with some more resources that might be more specific to what it is you need, either in your area or in your type of production. 
So we're going to start out today talking about um, the different areas uh, that might come into play in livestock production. We're going to start out with animal husbandry. For anyone who uh, maybe is involved with breeding or, or foaling or calving, um, all the way up to the weaning of certain animals, anyone who's been involved in this area knows that um, the, the temperaments of animals definitely will change. Um, you can never quite guarantee what an animal is going to do, specifically when there's uh, offspring involved or when they're breeding and in their mating seasons that really provides a, a chance or a high risk of injury. Anytime you're working with animals who are very unpredictable, there's a chance of being shoved into a chute or being stepped on or being injured in some way. And even if that injury tends to go away and you're able to control the pain very quickly, that might end up being an indicator of um, some osteoarthritis pain in the joint that was injured later on down the road. It might even show up in as, as many as five or 10 years, or it might show up within a few weeks. It really depends on the severity of that injury. If you move into the areas, if you think about all of the difficulties and the tasks associated with foaling and calving and lambing and farrowing, there's a lot of stress and worry and fatigue related to that as well. Those don't tend to be things that people think about when you're discussing osteoarthritis pain, uh, but there is research that shows that high levels of fatigue and stress are related to arthritis pain and arthritis flare-ups causing more pain, uh, even with osteoarthritis. So those are some things to consider. Is there a way that you can uh, more you know, streamline your operations so there's a little bit less stress? Do you have the proper monitoring systems? Have you taken all the proper precautions for the health of your animals? Anything that will lower your stress will also help to lower your arthritis pain as well. When we move into um, you know, the actual physicality of helping with that process, Anyone who has had to assist in a birthing process before knows just the physical work and the physical strain that's required. Um, you can see in, in the picture to the right, the two young men helping to pull a, a dairy calf. It's a lot of physical stress. And that strain and, and repetition that you're putting on your back and in your posture um, also is a, a very good indicator of, of a chance of having some arthritis pain. If you already have arthritis, putting yourself in that position is definitely going to open yourself up for more pain. And now I know some of you might say, well, there's no option. I have to be involved in that process. And that's true. But you also need to make sure that your body is prepared. Have you stretched? Can you wear a brace on your back to help you prepare for that type of pain? When we move into weaning, um, again, this is another area where the temperaments of the animals can be um, very extreme. You're separating a, a mother from its offspring. You're separating the offspring from what it's known. Um, the temperaments can, can get high. There's another good chance of injury in that area. So again, being aware of your surroundings is very important. Um, trying to utilize different uh, types of shoots and restraint systems or corralling systems to keep those animals separated and keeping yourself away from injury is very important. Again, the use of your physical strength sometimes comes into play if you have to separate those animals physically. And again, making sure that if you have arthritis pain, your grip strength might not be what is, what's needed or uh, your ability to reach or grab might not be as, as great as it once was. So you need to make sure you're aware of those limitations before you start into this procedure. Here's a couple of uh, examples and some pictures of just some general restraint systems. Um, I will say that you know I found the great picture of the um, the sheep corrals and the shoots at the top from our Michigan Agribility Program. It's a, a setup that they had that they shared on one of our social media sites. Um, being able to utilize systems like this takes you out of the, the way of danger. Being able to remove yourself from being inside the areas with the animals lessens your ch chances of being kicked or trampled or, or even smashed against the gates. And again, that's going to help with maintaining a healthy body and not having as much arthritis pain. If you already have arthritis, again, using shoots like this really makes your job easier because you're not physically having to do the work yourself. You're letting that machinery do the work for you. Moving into production and processing, there are several areas that we could talk about. And again, each of these could really have its own webinar. Um, but just touching on a few of them briefly, you know, if you're finishing out animals for market or maybe you have a feedlot operation, again, you're working with a large number of animals in a pen. And you're putting yourself in that pen with those animals um, where there's a risk of being stepped on or even knocked over. Sometimes those feedlots are, uh, are very large, and you have to be able to maneuver your way around those. 
severe arthritis pain in the knees and the ankles makes it very difficult sometimes to walk in those areas. Uh, maybe it's very painful to walk on the concrete that you might find in those feedlots. Um, and even the traction that you might have in your footwear could help there because you're walking sometimes on slippery surfaces um, or just on the concrete. Again, having some padding and control will help with the pain in your knees and in your ankles in that area. The processing um, that happens with several forms of livestock, you know, again, thinking of the long list that we could discuss, things like dehorning, clipping needle teeth, you know, castration, branding, ear tagging, all of those are very physical jobs. Um, I've done all of those jobs myself, and I know that there really isn't a great way to be able to get around the physicality of doing those tasks. But sometimes just using an alternative method or using an assistive technology uh, that might be able to help you, a certain tool. You'll see, for example, in the top picture, I have a, an image of two men trying to dehorn a calf. And on the next slide, um, we'll show a, another image that seems to work quite a bit easier just by using a, a different type of dehorning method. But really finding a way to use uh, the tools that are available for those type of jobs. And at the end of this presentation, if you come back to this webinar um, in the archive presentation, we actually have eight slides that list out about 199 different forms of assistive technology that are available in our toolbox through AgriBility. And there are some things in there that you really wouldn't consider to be necessary until you don't know that you need them. And then you see it on the list, and it really makes sense as something that you could be utilizing. Things like electric dehorners, um, different types of branding, whether you've decided to use you know, hot iron branding or freeze branding or tattooing as your method of identification. There are tools available to help with all of those tasks. In poultry, you know, if, you, if we're talking about things that are very repetitive, uh, certainly egg collection is one of those. Uh, depending on where your nests are for your hens, there might be a lot of bending and twisting involved. There might be a lot of carrying once you're putting the eggs into a collection type basket and how you're maneuvering those. That might be something you consider uh, if you have arthritis pain. Which type uh, or which step in that process is causing the most pain? Can you identify, is it the bending that's hurting the most or is it carrying? And then look into what are your options for making changes. Are there ways to lift those boxes up so they're higher so you can get into them easier? Or could you even use a cart or some form of, um, of carrying device on wheels or a sling that would help you to, to do your egg collection? And in dairy operations, there's, um, you know, very aptly named milker's knee, which is severe osteoarthritis in the knees of many dairymen who have been, you know, bending and, and kneeling up and down um, several times a day with several hundred cows to complete their milking processes. And there are, again, several things there that um, have been done either through agribility or just through, through the creativity of farmers themselves, coming up with different types of stools, um, coming up with carts on wheels, moving into a, an automatic milking parlor away from stanchion milking. There are several options there. But again, because of the whole nature of what you're doing with dairy processing, it's really important to be able to identify what specific step is causing you the most pain. Once you identify the step and the joint that's causing you the pain, then it's very easy to start assigning uh, options for how you're going to handle that pain control. Sheep and goat production, um, one of the things that I know growing up and, and raising sheep that was always the worst for me was always shearing and, and working with shearing our sheep. And again, I'll show you some images here in a second um, of the different methods to do that. But not only are you messing with an animal that um, you know, can weigh upwards of 100 to 200 pounds and trying to get it to stand still and get it to allow you to shear it, you're also holding a, a set of vibrating clippers and, and shears that are shaking your hands and, and causing a lot of added stress to um, your hands and your elbows. Something that always helped us there was wearing good sets of gloves that helped to absorb some of that shock and some of that vibration and using stands to help us with all of our shearing um, and trimming of sheep and goats as well. Okay, and here's a couple of examples, some of the pictures that I had talked about, um, some recommendations of things that you could do with that, those production and processing um, type of difficulties. Using livestock shoots or raised tables for shearing and hoof trimming, you'll see here um, you, we've got one of the tables that will lay down to allow you to put a dairy calf or a beef calf on a table to trim their hooves. Uh, we have a, an animal at the bottom that's in a chute being dehorned a little bit easier than the picture on the previous slide that had the two men cornering that calf to try to dehorn it. Um, so finding ways to, you know, use those tools that are available and asking for help 
you know, there's usually somebody out there that's going to be willing to help you with these jobs. And really, with raising livestock, there aren't very many jobs that are single man jobs. There are um, several methods that you can use with tools and restraint systems that allow you to work more independently, but sometimes you just can't do it by yourself. Some other things to think about would be anti-fatigue mats. If you are going to be working, um, you know, let's say you are working in a farrowing barn and you're clipping needle teeth and um, you're, you're processing piglets and, and doing ear notches, maybe putting a, an anti-fatigue mat down where you're standing so you're not standing on concrete for so long, affecting your ankles and your knees. And even using support poles for leverage. So if you do have to bend and kneel in your barn, whether it's in a, a dairy barn or even if it's in a a poultry production facility or in your hen house, if getting back up off the ground is a difficulty, installing some very simple support poles to help you get yourself back up off the ground is very helpful. Okay, and again, here's some pictures of the differences in shearing sheep um, on the ground. You'll notice that not only is he working with those heavy clippers that are vibrating in his hand, but he's having to restrain the animal as well as bend over. Um, the animal at the same time, so he's placing a lot of unnecessary strain on his lower back, on his knees, and on his arms, whereas you could put this animal on a stand like the picture in the right. It's very easily restrained. It can move somewhat, but not nearly as much as if it were on the ground. It's also brought that animal up to uh, an easier level to work with, so you're not bending as much with your lower back. So using any type of stand to raise the animals up to you is always a very good idea for osteoarthritis pain. Feeding conditions are another area that I think if anyone were asked what is the, the biggest problem sometimes with arthritis pain on the farm, I think feeding and watering would always come to the top of the list, at least I know they would for me. Transporting heavy bags of feed, whether you buy your feed in 40 or 50 pound bags or if you get your feed in bulk and, and loading it into bins. Carrying bales of hay, you know, the square bales are going to weigh anywhere up, to, up towards 60 pounds, some a little more, some a little less, depending on the type of hay and how well they're, they're packed. But, you know, carrying a 60-pound bale of hay with two metal or wire strings or two twine strings is still going to be very difficult on your hands. Um, you know, whether you grab it with one hand or two, it doesn't matter. You're still putting a lot of stress and strain on your shoulders and on your back. The location of your feed bunks is also very important. You know, are you having to carry five-gallon buckets of feed out through the pasture to feed your cattle, or is there a way that you can drive up and uh, drop feed in those bunks? Do you have a, a separate alleyway where you can walk safely to deliver feed to your livestock instead of having to wade through them, carrying your buckets back and forth, um, and having animals try to, to knock you down to get to that feed? Those are things that are very important to, um, to consider. Water delivery, again, is a, um, a, a very big stress on many farms. Anyone who has carried a five-gallon bucket full of water knows the weight that's involved there, the, the strain you put on your shoulders and on your wrists and your elbows. But in addition to that, just the, the handle on those buckets. The diameter is definitely not um, very well made for someone who has limited grip strength, um, who can't wrap their hand around those heavy wire handles or even a, a thin plastic handle. Um, so those are some things to consider. Are there ways that you can modify carrying that water or modify transporting that water to make it easier on your own body? The weather conditions, again, are something that you need to be considerate of. You know, we have to feed livestock, whether it's snowing outside or raining outside or 110 degrees outside. Weather can greatly affect uh, people's arthritis pain. For some, the heat actually allows them to work a little bit easier, but for others, the cold tends to help. So it really depends on, on the person understanding their own body limitations. And do you know that going out to feed in the winter is going to cause you more pain? Can you take precautions to help control that? And not just with bundling up and putting on hats and gloves, but also things like uh, the terrain you're going to be walking in. Are you walking in deep mud? Are you trying to traverse icy ground to get out to your livestock or to get into your barns? And making sure you take precautions to support your joints before you go out and do that. So the topography and the terrain, again, are very important. Um, you know, the difference of, of feeding sheep on a steep hillside and the easiness or the ease of feeding them in a small feedlot on flat ground it's the same type of job, but it's much different depending on where you're feeding and how you have to um, access those areas where you're going to be doing that feeding. So some recommendations that come along with those feeding conditions, things that you might be able to implement that could help you. Um, you know, things like being aware of your animal's location and temperament, again, are very important, especially with, you know, feeding time. If they're hungry, very much like, uh, you know, in their breeding seasons, their temperaments can flare. and um, and at times, even the nicest of animals can become very uh, pushy and, and very dangerous. 
having a clear working area and pathway so you know that you can very easily get out to them to give them their feed and their water without putting yourself in the middle of the, um, the group of livestock. Maybe they're on small pens and you can walk around the edges and feed them. Maybe they're in a large pen and you can drive the edges. Or if you do have to go into those pens, is there a way that you can separate and keep the animals away from you while you go about your feeding? Wearing proper gloves and body cover, again, if you're working it out in the weather, is very important. Um, the gloves not only will help you to protect your joints from the cold, but they'll also help you with your, your grip. It gives you something that's a little bit softer to grip on. It also helps with your grip diameter by adding the thickness of those gloves. Proper footwear with tread support um, and good ankle support is very important. Um, several farmers and ranchers I know are very fond of their cowboy boots, but at the same time, you know, riding and, and mounting up and down on horses is great to have boots, but if you're working in a pasture that's thick with mud or slippery with ice, having a pair of cowboy boots with a heel and no traction is not the best type of footwear. So really understanding what type of footwear is, uh, is proper is going to help. Bucket handle grips are something that you can add on very simply. Uh, you know, this could be something as simple as wrapping duct tape around the handles of all of your buckets or getting pipe insulation from the local hardware store and making your own insulated foam padded handles. But any time that you can increase the diameter and the softness of that grip on that bucket is really going to help you uh, when it comes to carrying all that extra weight. Maybe even using hose reels or automatic watering systems. Now, this might not be effective if you're working with 400 head of cattle out on a, an open pasture and you've got large stock tanks of water that need to be um, checked or need to be filled. But if you're working in smaller areas, is there a way that you could take the water to the livestock without having to carry it? Looking into all of your options. Uh, even using a utility vehicle, if you do have to go out into larger areas, can you put the feed, um, whether it's hay or grain or buckets of water or supplements, even mineral blocks, in the back of a utility vehicle and drive that out to where it needs to be rather than carrying it and using your own body weight to transport that weight. A hay bale carrying stick is one of my favorite type of tools, and I apologize I didn't put a picture of it in um, this PowerPoint, but it's just very simply a, a one to two inch diameter dowel rod that has a few slits cut in it at an angle, and you can slip that dowel rod up inside um, or underneath the, the baler's twine or underneath the wire on a bale of hay or straw, and it helps you transport that bale without having to use your hands cutting into the wire and without having to um, use both hands on both sides. You can very easily use one arm or one hand to transport a bale. It's a very simple and easy fix. And then also, you know, depending on the size of your lot, maybe even having, um, you know, auger type feeding systems or a, a grain cart type feeding system where you can drive and, and naturally deliver that feed to those animals without having to physically carry it yourself. And you'll see that in a few of the following pictures. Here's a bucket holder. Um, on one side, this is a great little uh, device if you're feeding smaller livestock or if you're working out um, even with just a few horses in a barn and you want to carry a couple of three-quart buckets. Very simple, um, very lightweight. Just one handle and it helps you carry two different buckets. You'll notice that the size of the diameter on the handle of the carrier is much bigger than um, the diameter of the handles on the buckets themselves. And it allows you to distribute the weight a little bit more evenly by using these type of carriers. And then the other pictures just simply show um, the different types of feeding operations, again, based on the size of what you're doing. Not everyone is feeding out um, enough pigs to be able to use an automated feeding type system. Not everyone is feeding out enough cattle to need to use a bunker type feed system with a grain cart. But if you are at that level, certainly making sure that the, the amount of technology that you use or the amount of assistive tools that you use directly relates to the size of your operation. Once you reach a certain level with a, a number of head of livestock, it doesn't become very efficient to do everything by hand any longer. Equipment and maintenance is another big area um, of concern when we're working on the farm and on the ranch. There is always a fence that needs mended or a gate latch that won't open properly. Um, again, we've talked about the terrain and the ground conditions there's always going to be something that breaks on the farm and you have to repair it, you have to fix it, or sometimes even replace it. In addition to that, we have to consider some of the animals that um, are in different type of living conditions. If they're not out on pasture or out on the range, do you have them in pens where you have to bed down their, their stall areas? Do you have to dispose of the manure? Those are different areas that you also need to consider that cause quite a bit of joint stress and strain. I know growing up, anytime we had to clean out our livestock pens, it was one of those days where you just had to really get yourself prepared 
because you knew you were going to be doing a lot of heavy shoveling and lifting and pushing and carrying to get those stalls bedded down properly and cleaned out properly. And there are a lot of different options now looking back that I know we could have used that we have even started using today that make it a little bit easier. So some things to consider there. You know, we do a lot of tack repair on our home farm. We have a lot of leather work with saddles and bridles. And there have been some times where I've physically seen, you know, my grandparents and my parents who weren't able to use the leather or the cord that they were using for repair because they couldn't grip it correctly. They started using a button hook that you would use on your shirt that you would stick through a buttonhole and, and thread it through. And it was very easy to use that as a tool to even repair things that using leather or cord or string. It didn't even have to be tack repair. It could be gardening tools or anything like, of the like. But finding a way to use a tool if you have difficulty using your fingers or your hands will really help. Using swivel stools or wheeled chairs, um, if you are in a shop and you're working on equipment repair or, or tack repair or cleaning, instead of getting up and down to, to carry things around where you need them, maybe getting a small chair on wheels or a stool where you can rotate yourself to be able to grab all of your tools and your cleaning equipment without having to get up and down every five or six minutes. Now, after you've been there for a while, there is something to be said for getting up and stretching and changing positions. You don't want to stay in the same position for too long, but it does cut down on that repetitive movement of standing up and sitting back down and, and moving around quite a bit. You know, even things like using doorknob grips that are made for a house out in the barn. Um, you know, just because they make these great doorknob grips for your bedroom or your kitchen door doesn't mean you can't use them on a feed room door or a, um, you know, a milking parlor where you have an actual door handle that's difficult to grip, to grip or grasp. Uh, if you don't want to buy doorknob grips, you know, again, wrapping some tape around those or somehow just increasing the diameter will really help. Gate latches were a huge problem on my family farm. I remember watching my grandfather have difficulty opening several gates because of the arthritis in his hand. Um, you know, he couldn't do the double-ended snap hooks. He couldn't do bull hooks anymore. Um, we had to go to different alternative gate latches, some of them homemade, some of them consisting of nothing more than a, a piece of 2 by 4 on a screw that, that swiveled or pivoted. But finding some way to make it easier to get in and out of those areas and, and access those gates uh, will help tremendously with arthritis pain. We've talked about footwear quality, so we won't go into that too much more. But you know, when it comes to um, disposing of manure, you know, using wheelbarrows to dispose of manure or muck buckets gets very heavy and puts a lot of stress and strain on your shoulders. Um, if you do have to use a wheelbarrow, I suggest using the ones that have one solid handle across the front instead of the two separate wooden handles. The two separate handles put a lot of strain on your shoulders, whereas the single handle allows you to use more of your own body weight to push that wheelbarrow. But if you're doing a lot of manure disposal, maybe even looking into things like manure spreaders or a pasture vac or something that allows you to, to access and, and get that manure picked up a little bit easier without having to use pitchforks and manure forks. Another option there is looking into the different type of bedding options. You know, straw is very heavy when it gets wet and soiled. It's very difficult to clean out, but it's also very cost efficient to use. But there are some other options like um, different types of pelleted bedding, different types of flakes of sawdust, whether it's a fine flake or a thick flake. It really just depends on what type of operation you have and how many um, stalls or how many pins you're cleaning as to what type of bedding you use. Post hole diggers and, and drivers and fence maintenance tools, again, are always um, sources of arthritis pain, especially if you have severe pain in your shoulders. Using a, a manual set of post hole diggers is a very difficult task. Maybe considering using an automatic post hole digger um, or the different type of fence maintenance tools that come um, with several suggestions in that toolbox that you can look into later. Training and showing is an area we won't go into too much. Um, you know, it only affects people who really get into these different areas of livestock production, whether you're fitting and, and grooming for livestock shows, um, using horses for, for riding or ranch work or cow work, obviously have a lot of um, areas for joint stress and pain, depending on what you're doing. Um, trailer loading is another area that some people don't consider um, to be a, an area of arthritis pain, but if you consider training those animals to go in and out of a trailer and just physically maneuvering them in and out, again, you're putting your body in a lot of situations where there's a chance for injury and a risk um, of arthritis pain. 
So there are some simple recommendations you can also use for um, the showing and, and training aspects. If you ride horses uh, quite often and you have severe pain in your knees, there's always the options of using mounting blocks and mounting steps. But there's also different stirrup extenders that you can use for mounting and dismounting that make things a lot easier on your body. Um, using things like grooming chutes and stands we've talked about, anytime you can get those animals in a secure location is always going to help lessen your injuries, lessen your chance of injury. Using things like shoulder slings or straps for grooming equipment. Um, anyone who has ever shown livestock or went to um, a livestock show knows that you have a lot of equipment that needs to be used. And sometimes it's heavy equipment. If you've had to use a, a cattle blower, for example, it's a very large vacuum type um, setup that, that's fairly heavy and you're moving it around quite a bit. You know, is there a way to put that on a cart so you can move that around a little bit easier? Or even take um, just some simple cord and make a sling to hold that hose up to your body so you're not carrying it and putting all that stress and strain on your wrists and on your shoulders. You know, do you have you know, the, your animals properly trained for what you need them to do? Are you, you know, having to fight and, and push and pull and use your physical force to get the work done? Again, anyone who's shown cattle knows what it's like to halt or break that calf for the first time. And when you're young, it doesn't seem like it's such a big issue. But the, as you start to age a little bit more and you realize what you're really putting your body through, it's a very high chance and high risk for injury at that time. Balancing your schedule is also very important. Some people wouldn't really consider that um, as something that could be done to help maintain or manage your arthritis pain. But really knowing you know, your best times to work during the day and knowing when to take a break because your body has reached that point where it has worked so long that it's starting to show some pain, balancing your schedule to get your work done is, is very important and making sure that you know your own physical limitations in your body. Veterinarian health care is also another issue. Um, if we think about the positions our veterinarians put themselves in or our farriers working with hoof care and bending uh, and, and holding those heavy animals, I myself know several farriers who have retired um, way before their prime and very early in life because of the back pain um, and the leg pain that they've had because of the physicality of that work. And again, they're also working with animals whose temperaments are, are involved there. It's not just um, you know feeding or um, or going out and taking water, but you're physically holding and restraining an animal with your body that at times can be very dangerous. Some things that can be used there to help with your arthritis pain, using wheeled carts, again, anytime you can bring your tools to you without having to carry them and physically lift them is always um, going to work. We've talked about the livestock shoots and restraining those animals. Magnetic belts and cuffs for some of your tools. Uh, veterinarians and farriers often use these, again, to make it easy for them to be able to access what they're working with. Um, and then, you know, one thing that my veterinarian uses, he has arthritis in his hands, he uses the jar openers that you would use in your kitchen for everyday um, tasks like opening your mayonnaise or your pickle jars, and he uses those for animal medications as well. He carries them in all of his toolkits, and it really helps him to get a better grip on things with his arthritis pain. We've talked about mobility already, so we won't spend a lot of time here. We've talked about having clear and unobstructed workways so you're not putting yourself in a position of injury. Uh, you know, horseback riding obviously is putting you um, in a position where you have a lot of vibration and a lot of um, concussion and a lot of compression. So taking breaks, being able to get on and off your horse to stretch and let your body rest is very important as well. And there are some things that can, that can help there as well, depending on the size of your operation. Again, you know, bump gates and cattle guards are great for not having to get in and out of your farm truck and open gates and close gates, but on a smaller operation might not be very efficient. So again, you have to look into your own situ situation and your own system and really identify what's going to help you the best. Automatic hitches, again, are a way that you can not have to enter and exit your farm equipment as you're hitching up you know, a manure spreader or, or a truck or trailer. Um, but again, having help in those situations will help as well, not having to do all of the work yourself. So all of these things kind of come down to one buzzword that we've talked about. Um, you know, things that help you and things that are going to help you be the most efficient really comes down to this word of ergonomics, which is just helping your body most appropriately work with what you have and making sure that your body is available and has the limitations um, that are needed. 
knowing the proper angle of your joints and knowing which joints are taking the most weight while you're working is very important so you can protect those joints in advance. Um, the grip diameter and strength I've, I've talked about a few times. You know, if you have to grip more um, to where your thumb overlaps your forefinger, that grip is too small for your hands. Finding a way to increase the diameter will greatly help with arthritis pain um, in your hands specifically. So we've talked about all of the different types of arthritis pain and limitations, knowing your own joint strength. There are several medical options that can be looked into as well that really need to be discussed with your healthcare professional. Um, this is not something that you need to take into consideration on your own, but really talk to someone about what are your options as far as supplements are concerned or topical ointments, um, even going as far as injections and prescription medications depending on the level of your pain. And then the last thing I do want to talk about today is, you know, what are your planning options? Maybe the type of operation you have isn't the best type of operation for you anymore, depending on your arthritis pain. Maybe at some point this has become too much to do you know, 400 head of beef cattle or 200 head of sheep. Maybe you need to sit down and talk with your family about what are my needs, what are the family needs, the, the sustainability of our operation, and should we look at maybe modifying that in some way? Maybe we need to use different types of tools or technology. Maybe we can reduce the herd size, or instead of going from a farrow to finish operation, you move to a wean to finish operation. There are several options out there, and I know this is always a farmer or a rancher's very last option. They never want to change what they're doing because of their pain, but at some point in time, it might be the best way to balance how they manage their arthritis pain and still maintain their productivity on their farm or their ranch. So those are some very important questions that you need to ask yourself as well, or be prepared to talk with someone who is having arthritis pain and difficulty in your area. These might be areas um, of discussion that need to be brought up at some point in time. And with that, what I would like to do is just uh, let you know that if you can come back to this website when it is archived, the notes section in each of these slides includes several websites um, for several really good resources that are listed on this slide from our other agribility programs, uh, the National Agribility Toolbox, and even some publications and textbooks that are available online that will really give you good information um, that can be utilized. So please take the time to come back once this is archived and look into some of these resources and see if there's anything that can um, help you further after we, we're done discussing. And again, that's just some more resources that you can certainly look into that we have provided from Agribility. And what I'd like to do at that point is um, Thanks so much, Amber, for that uh, very useful information. Uh, as Amber indicated, we are uh, taking questions. So if you would like to uh, ask one, either please type that in the chat window or use the raise hand icon if you have a microphone. We will plan to uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We will um, activate your microphone so you can ask that verbally. Before we do that, though, I'd like to give our full, four quick poll questions. And the first one uh, simply asks what your affiliation is. And if you could choose the best possible option there, we'd appreciate that. Also, if uh, more than one person was viewing at your site, we'd appreciate you uh, making a note of that in the chat window so that we can get a uh, accurate count of exactly how many people participated in the webinar. Okay. I'll broadcast those results of the first poll question. Thank you for your participation there. The next question asks about the information that was shared today. You could tell us if you found it to be uh, valuable and if it met your expectations. We appreciate that. Okay, thank you for your participation.
The next question asks about the technology that was used. Did you find it to be effective and usable today? And if you did have some specific issues, if you got uh, knocked out of the room, disconnected, um, any other problems like that, if you could please indicate that in the chat window. Uh, we appreciate as much specific information as possible so that we can try to resolve those issues in the future. Okay, thank you for your input on that question. And finally, based on today's session, would you attend another session in this series? <clears throat> Speaking of other sessions in this series, we are planning our uh, annual virtual conference, May 10th through the 12th, the Virtual National Training Workshop. And if you'd like more information on that, please uh, visit the agribility.org website and look under online training. And uh, uh, did I say in the wrong month? December? Sorry, December 10th through 12th. Uh, yes, that's posted on our website, and the correct date is there. So uh, if you'd like to register for that or are interested in the sessions, please uh, visit the site. OK. At this point, uh, I would like to turn things back over to Amber for questions and answers. You will notice that the link for the archive is already up on the page here. And the online training site that you see, or the link there, will also take you to uh, information on the virtual NTW. So I will turn things back over to Amber. Great. Thanks, Paul. We did have a few questions come in that um, I will address and then a couple of other notes that I wanted to add that we didn't quite get to have time for today. Um, the first question that came through is, is one type of livestock best, it just went away, um, for people with arthritis pain? And the answer to that really is, is no. It, depending on each individual person's type of arthritis pain, whether they already have arthritis and they're wanting to start a livestock industry, or whether they're already involved in livestock and then have arthritis pain, it's not just simply something where we can say, yes, raising goats is best for people with arthritis in their back, or raising sheep is, is better. It, it really depends on each individual person's arthritis pain and management plan. Um, now, if you have very severe arthritis in your hands and your elbows, getting involved in a type of operation that involves a lot of hand and, and lifting and, and control movements there is maybe not the best option. But then again, if you have severe arthritis pain in your knees and you're working through a, a lot of issues with your cattle ranching, it doesn't necessarily mean that cattle ranching is not for you. It just means you have to make changes to, to adapt to make that work for you through your arthritis pain. So no, there, there's no set um, assignment of the type of livestock that works best with certain forms of arthritis. The next question is, if arthritis makes simple tasks painful, how do you know when to work through the pain and when to stop? And that is a very common question, even with people who aren't involved in agriculture at all, but anyone in the United States or, or in the world that has arthritis pain, they tend to work through their pain. They tend to say, you know, it's just part of my everyday life. It's something I have to deal with. And I would highly suggest that you don't work through the pain. That's a, a very important part of understanding your body's limits, knowing when you have reached the area of saying, this is starting to become difficult. My, my grip is becoming decreased, my reach is becoming decreased, or I'm just feeling the twinges of the pain and the stiffness, that's when it's time for you to stop it and take a break. And I know several ranchers and farmers who say, I can't take breaks during the day. It's not an option for me. But if you want to control your pain effectively, it, it's going to have to be a part of your day. And that's that difficulty of changing routine um, that has to come into play. Even if it's a very simple five-minute break sitting on an upturned five-gallon bucket, just allowing your joints to rest a little bit before you continue that work is very important. Please don't work through the pain. Um, that will actually, in, in effect, 
make your arthritis pain worse. It's going to make it um, stay around longer. It's going to make it more difficult to control. And that kind of takes me into the other topic that I did want to bring up. I, I didn't have a lot of time to discuss what are your options for pain management and control um, outside of going and seeing your doctor. You know, obviously there are several over-the-counter options, you know, Tylenol, arthritis, Aleve, um, different topical ointments and creams. But then there's also just very simple things like using an ice pack or using a heating pad to help with your pain. If it's a very acute arthritis pain that, that maybe just that one day you overworked it a little bit and it's very acute and hurting, using ice on it, you know, 15 minutes on or 20 minutes on and then in 20 minutes off, alternating that ice um, will help. If it's more of a long-term uh, pain, if it's something that's a little bit deeper and it's, it's really more of a, um, a swelling down deep, using more moist heat will help. Using a heating pad or, or even taking a hot shower will help at that point. So there are several options there. Using braces is very important. If you can use a, a wrist brace or you know a back brace if you know you're going to be doing heavy lifting, I can't stress enough how important it is to really protect and support your joints before you start to do that work. So at this point, um, I don't see any more questions that have popped up, but it looks like Paul has another announcement for you, so I'm going to turn it back over to him. Thanks, Amber. Uh, just a couple more notes on the virtual national training workshop that's coming up. Here's the exact link if you would like more information about that. And just a couple of the sessions um, that we're planning to share in that webinar series include... Um, Alternative Production Systems for Farmers with Disabilities, Local Food and Beyond, a session on the Affordable Care Act for Rural Americans. So if you're not uh, sure about what's involved in that, that might be a good session for you to look at. We're going to be talking about working with veterans and the work of the Farmer Veteran Coalition, uh, product liability and farm equipment, and also selecting and evaluating farm enterprises for individuals with disabilities in addition to some other uh, sessions. So if you're interested in that, uh, if that sounds like something you'd be uh, like to participate in, please uh, visit that website and uh, there's an evaluation link, or excuse me, a, a registration link there too. So uh, it looks like there are no further at this point, so we have to thank Amber again for uh, her uh, excellent presentation today. Um, I will put up her uh, contact information when we're done so that if you would like to contact her, if you have further questions in the future, you can feel free to do that. So thank you all for participating and have a good rest of the day.